this time around, when a civilian uh, prime minister was ousted, uh, fairly or unfairly, by a military regime, lots of people came out, is because in the past, when the military had intervened, and uh, usually unfairly uh, and and uh, with uh, by hook and crook, to oust a civilian prime minister on the basis, oh well, he's corrupt, etc., which they were. Um, the people uh, understood that yes, actually they they have been very corrupt and they have mm-hmm. done nothing for them. So for the people, it made actually no difference whether it was a civilian regime or a military regime in terms of their socioeconomic uh, status and so on and so forth. It actually made no difference. Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. Despite a population of over 200 million and a nuclear arsenal, Pakistan's political turmoil has gone largely ignored in mainstream media, often overshadowed by the war in Ukraine. In April of last year, Pakistan's Imran Khan was ousted as prime minister, which he blamed on foreign powers for interfering in the country's democratic process. Khan quickly made claims of an American-backed coup due to his non-aligned foreign policy, and his removal has been followed by political instability that continues to roil the country today. A longtime critic of the U.S. war in Afghanistan and its drone wars, he took a defiant stance against the EU and the West in general, especially as the Cold War against Russia and China escalated. While Pakistan's leaders have never completed their terms, with some being assassinated or executed or having their planes mysteriously crash, something unique took place in the aftermath of Khan's ouster, some of the largest protests in Pakistan's history, both in support of him, but also in opposition to the traditional ruling elites. The current government has responded by cracking down on Khan and his supporters and preventing new elections. Khan, who's been holding massive demonstrations while demanding elections, has been threatened with arrest and has alleged attempted assassinations against him. To help us understand what happened and what we can expect, I'm joined by Junaid Ahmed, professor of religion, law, and global politics, and director of the Center for the Study of Islam and Decoloniality in Islamabad, Pakistan. But before we jump into it, this is just the first half of this episode. The second half is available for Breakthrough News members only. You can become a member at patreon.com slash breakthrough news. And as always, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell so you get a notification whenever we post new content. And if you appreciate this show, you can also donate below on YouTube. Junaid, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Rania. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm glad to finally do this and have you have your uh, Dispatches debut, which is a lot more delayed than I would have liked it to be. Um, And there's so much to talk about here. So much has been happening uh, in Pakistan, and you're there right now. You've been writing lots of articles about it, uh, which I've been following. So, and of course, you know, Pakistan is so often ignored in the West um, because it's not Ukraine, uh, but it's a very important country over 200 million <laughs> Maybe we people. can move it geographically over there. Yeah. Maybe if we could just move it geographically and change the way everybody looks, people would start right. paying attention. Definitely. Um, the looks part is but, important. Yeah. Exactly. But no, obviously Pakistan is like very importantly located geostrategically. Um, and is a very powerful country um, and has often been, you know, uh, uh, in the sort of like U.S. circle of 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 allied states. Um, and then last year, something very interesting happened. You had the ouster of the prime minister, Imran Khan. So let's start there, because I think for, for those who maybe haven't been following what's been taking place, can you just kind of br- br- briefly walk us through why was Imran Khan ousted from power as prime minister last year and what has transpired since then? Right. So uh, this is a, um, a long story that actually precedes even Imran Khan, uh, the former very popular cricketer turned politician in 1997, um, uh, Pakistani. He only entered politics in 97, and uh, he became prime minister in 2018. But the story is 
sort of then, as I said, precedes his actually coming to power. Uh, and that story has been one of Imran Khan presenting himself and his political movement as an alternative to the way dominant political life has been in Pakistan. Whether it be civilian rule or military rule, because our viewership should know that the Pakistani military has played an inordinate role in the political life of the country. And so basically ruling the country for half of its existence. So uh, with all of uh, the, the corruption, the incompetence going on at the top levels of Pakistan's a political life from the very inception, the, the birth of Pakistan, 1947. Khan, after half a century, and the movement that he started called PTI, uh, translates as Movement for Justice, Pakistan Tariqe Insaf, uh, was meant to offer an alternative. And if you had to simplify it, you could say that there were two main items on his agenda. One was um, the uh, uh, one was a severe, scathing critique of the civilian politicians and basically all of Pakistan's rulers that had plundered and pillaged such a poor country in the in the first place. Um, and so, the anti-corruption and social justice uh, 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 plank was was one of the main points that Khan was emphasizing. The second point was, uh, I mean, so his party started in 97. Four years later, 9-11 happens. Mm. And then, uh, of course, the United States declares its war on terror. And it gives a, a little phone call to General Pervez Musharraf, who was there at the time, uh, Under Secretary of State, let's uh, name him, Dick Armitage calls a Pervez Musharraf and says that if you do not uh, cooperate with us in waging this war in the AFPAC, what they called very condescendingly AFPAC theater of the war on terror, Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, we'll just have to send you back to the Stone Age. Mm. So this is just a, like a polite way of asking for you to participate polite. with us. <laughs> I guess so, it's more polite to ask than to like drop a bomb. Right. Right. So, um, you know, I, and, and so Pakistan had, had, had very little choices. Uh, there's criticisms to be made that perhaps uh, we, Pakistan, the Musharraf and others uh, could have uh, held out a little longer. But uh, um, it, 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 it actually became quite a, 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 an awkward situation um, as the 20 years of the war on terror unfolded because it, 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 it never was the case. And of course, this is why the American national security state has always hated uh, sections of the military and Khan because they never really played ball completely with the Americans in terms of, of trying to rout out the uh, Taliban from Afghanistan. So, but, but, so this was the second issue for, for, for Imran Khan. Khan was basically saying, which a view that many of us share, that one, the war is immoral, uh, the human toll and cost that it will take in Afghanistan and its spillover effects, which we did see into Pakistan. Uh, and, and number two, that it's going to be counterproductive. It's actually going to fuel more militancy uh, in, in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And um, sadly, uh, well, I mean, what, what one can see is uh, Khan coming to power and especially, you know, Trump was Trump does what he wants. But especially when Biden comes to power, you, you can see that the American national security state never forgave Khan for effectively being right mm. <laughs> about about what was going to happen. Uh, if the United States undertook the type of policy uh, that it did uh, since 9/11, so Imran Khan comes from a, a back. So that's one part of it. That's like the like his real political positions. But beyond that, uh, which again may seem trivial, but is not in a context in which you have the most 
uh, venal, corrupt uh, politicians you can find on anywhere in the planet. I mean, yeah. I say that and then I find another friend from somewhere else in Latin America that will say the same and then we start fighting. But but the point is that but it but it's 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 just been um, a a country that's been impoverished by its elites uh, in so many different ways and and the two main political parties which are basically family dynasties they're like mm-hmm. feudal dynasties the Pakistan People's Party which is largely based in the province of Sindh. Um, and that was of the old Bhutto. Uh, the founder was Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. His, his daughter then also became prime minister. Benazir Bhutto was assassinated in 2007. And then the other major political party, the Pakistan Muslim League, which is primarily has been primarily based in the largest province in the country, and that is the Punjab. Mm-hmm. And one of the issues right now is that since Punjab has had this kind of almost neo-colonial relationship with the other provinces in Pakistan, in Punjab was where the heart of like this what we call the PMNL, Pakistan Muslim um, uh, League Nawaz Sharif group. That is where PTI has hit PMNL really hard and is like like winning left, right, and center, and oh, okay. so. These two political parties have been the dominant political parties, have run Pakistani political life since the late 1980s, and have basically played musical chairs in coming into power, uh, plundering and pillaging the country as much as they can, going out of power and letting the other one then do it. And this is what's been going on. And in between, a, a military dictatorship comes around as well. Uh, and so for the people... And this is this is actually going. This is very important to understand why uh, this time around, when a civilian uh, prime minister was ousted, uh, fairly or unfairly, by a military regime, lots of people came out. Is because in the past, when the military had intervened, and uh, usually unfairly uh, and and uh, with uh, by hook and crook to oust a civilian prime minister on the basis, oh, well, he's corrupt, etc., which they were, uh, the people uh, understood that, yes, actually, they, they have been very corrupt and they have mm-hmm. done nothing for them. So for the people, it made actually no difference whether it was a civilian regime or a military regime in terms of their socioeconomic uh, status and so on and so forth, it actually made no difference. In fact, Musharraf, I mean, you know, you have to remind people that, like, even when General Pervez Musharraf came in a coup in 1999, only by 2007 did you get, like, mass protests opposing him. Um, Mm -hmm. So this has been the sad state of Pakistani politics over over the course of the majority of the country's history. And so this is the context in which uh, Imran Khan comes and, 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 makes these, and makes these promises. I mean, and, and the, the evolution of a political, like, I mean, we know how hard it is in like these duopolies, two party political, uh, you know, uh, two party systems, whether it's in the United States or in the United Kingdom or where, wherever else. Um, for a third party to enter is not easy, especially if right. those parties have been so entrenched for so long. And so for him, uh, uh, I guess the viewership should get an idea that, wow, okay, people are pretty much fed up with what's been going on, that they're willing to give this former cricketer <laughs> turned politician uh, a chance. Now, now the, the thing I did want to emphasize beyond the politics is that he had enormous um, credibility uh, and legitimacy in terms of his integrity in yeah. the country. Uh, so he was a, a, a philanthropist. He built the first uh, cancer, uh, free cancer hospital in Asia, named after his late mom who died of cancer, um, and, and just well-respected from, from cricket days when he led the, the Pakistani cricket team to the World Cup and won it in 1992 to the present. Um, and so people often downplay this part and talk about the politics, which they correctly critique, you know, on, on, yeah. on, on many grounds. But they kind of forget that like, 
in comparison to the entire rest of the political law, this guy stands in a class of his own in terms of just personal integrity and honesty. And so that that, that is that cannot be discarded as as another factor as well for his uh, popularity. Well, so no, I, I want to get to that. I want to talk a little bit more about like his base and the people who've come. Be, there's been these massive mobilizations uh, that he's been able to help organize. Um, and I want to talk a little bit more about the sort of internal dynastic political parties that you're referring to in Pakistan. But first, you know, he did Imran Khan when he was ousted from power. It was like in this kind of parliamentary coup, if you will. Um, he did allege that it was an American backed coup. So. I'm curious if we can talk yeah. a little bit about some of the sort of like non-aligned foreign policy positions he took that may have contributed yeah. to, you know, you talked a little bit about it in terms of when the war on terror got started, but during his time in office, I mean, you know, he was opposed to drone strikes into these military operations yeah. in Pakistan's tribal region, um, which uh, upset the Americans. Uh, but he also kind of did something a little bit different by making foreign policy kind of like a part of public discourse. Um, mm -hmm in a way that maybe it hadn't been before, yeah. um, and if, if I'm not mistaken, and before it was typically controlled by the military. Am I right to say that? And I don't know if you'd like to Absolutely. elaborate a bit. Absolutely, okay. you're right. Okay. And then also, I want to ask, like, the you know, prior to the war in Ukraine, um, what was his relationship with the U.S. government? Because then we can maybe talk about also what his position on the war in Ukraine was, which kind of pissed off the Americans. But before that, like, did he have a close relationship with the Americans, despite maybe, you know, vocally like opposing certain policies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the Ukraine thing will be very funny. But, yeah. So, so I can't. I can't uh, wait to kind of speak about it. But the poor guy just landed in, in Moscow the day the, the, day <laughs> the Russians yeah. under, undertook the special military operation in Ukraine. So, I mean, th that that's just a ridiculous part that let's come back to in just a little, in yeah, a little yeah. bit, the, the Ukraine thing. Um, so like I said, that I always felt, uh, and not just me, but others, that the American national security state or the deep state never forgave Khan for being so consistently correct in in what was going on in Afghanistan. I mean, how much more correct can you be when the Taliban in one month, without even a, putting up a fight, just yeah. take over Kabul in 2010? I mean, so I, I, they never forgave him for that. And, it, and, it, and it's so... Um, it's 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 such an indictment of how pathetic uh, Biden and the people that are advising him uh, are that th even during this year, you know, the, the, the negotiations with the Taliban began under Trump. Mm -hmm. But um, so the year that uh, they, they, they're coming out now, they've agreed to come out and withdraw from from Afghanistan. Joe Biden did not phone Imran Khan even once. Coming to wow. power, <laughs> coming to power even during the withdrawal where Pakistan was helping the United States. The U.S. soldiers were staying in these hotels in Islamabad trying to get them out as well. And still Biden did not call Imran Khan. Khan so never, like a, yeah. It was like a snub. Yeah, it was snub, which Khan doesn't give a damn about, actually. Right. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, he, he could care less about. Um, but, uh, but 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 it it, it it points to what I was saying earlier that, like, you know, the the American national security state was really, I think, re really angry and, and pissed off that 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 basically Khan was right about this. So 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 you're right. So that was that was a major thing. It wasn't it wasn't a small thing. That was a major thing because, as you said, like drone strikes. American special forces entering into Pakistani territory, basically the ongoing violation of Pakistani sovereignty by supposedly a country that calls Pakistan a major non-NATO ally, right? And um, so, uh, so uh, the and, and the drone strike marches were amazing because these are two areas in the northwest of the country which are very difficult to go to, uh, heavily guarded by the military, journalists can't go there. Khan would lead marches and rallies to which people like Medea Benjamin, Kathy Kelly, these people, I know this too because I, I went on some of them and I had them in my classes come and speak mm -hmm. as well. 
um, were going and joining him on these marches against drone strikes. And so, you know, I mean, he was basically making everyone angry, including sections of the Pakistani government, both civilian and military, that would in public denounce the drone strikes, but in private say, well, you know, well, if it's, if it's one of those militants that actually bothers us as well, if it's like one of the bad Taliban's, not the good Taliban, then okay, go, go for it. <clears throat> go for the go, drone strike. So, so, uh, so you know, Khan throughout, that, that, that was a big issue that we covered. But you're absolutely right. He comes to power, um, again, with, with, with a mandate. But, of course, many people say, and, and I think they correctly say, that at this particular point, the Pakistani military itself also feels that the two ma other major political parties are uh, getting too big for their shoes, uh, are uh, p uh, plundering and pillaging the country, and the Pakistani military's cut of like the of the, like, of the pizza pie, for example, whatever, is getting lower and lower, and so they have their own antagonisms with the other political parties, and the other political parties want their want some benefits and privileges. And some some very legitimate uh, 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 grievances that they have. So the Pakistani military has its own beef with those two political parties. Mm -hmm. And then you have this character Imran Khan. I mean, he has a political party, this PTI, but but but, but the real figure is uh, you know Imran Khan, obviously. Right. Yeah. And and the thing is that in this situation, as you correctly pointed out, the Pakistani military especially in the domain of foreign policy, has held a monopoly in terms of, of the decision making. And there was, a, there, there was a term that immediately the liberals and the left applied, which was absolutely ridiculous. And I, I know that you've, you've, you've been over this term before as well. Uh, but, it, but the term was the hybrid regime, right? The hybrid mm -hmm. regime of, of mm -hmm. Imran Khan and 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 the Pakistani military. Why? Oh, because it seems like they seem eye to eye on questions of, say, the uh, say Pakistani sovereignty, that Americans should not be engaged in drone attacks, that, uh, yeah, that, that Pakistan should be a sovereign country. Therefore, it's a hybrid regime and Khan is so such a puppet of the military. Okay. I mean, which is absolutely ridiculous. If you really want to talk, and I and I really want to emphasize this, you really want to talk about hybrid regimes. Hybrid regimes have been in Pakistan since the light, late 1980s, when all of these civilian, uh, civilian governments, like I said, the government of the Pakistan People's Party, the Bhutto family, and the Pakistan Muslim League of the Nawaz Sharif family, they have, a, they have perfectly aligned themselves with the military. Let the military do and say anything on foreign policy while their main objective is just to plunder the country. Let me give you an example. Benazir Bhutto, daughter of the East, the big uh, famous Democrat, and of course we all lament the way that she was assassinated. Her second round in government, her second period in government when she came, her husband became known from Mr. 5% to Mr. 7% to Mr. 10% because that's the amount of kickbacks he would take on any single deal made wow. in the country. It seemed like her second stint in power had two, two functions. One was to, of course, the, the same function that all the political parties have, make as much money as you can. And the second was to actually have her brother killed. That may sound very, yeah, yeah. I, the way casually I said that, her brother was a somewhat still a um, uh, uh, somewhat still stood by the principles of the old Pakistan P People's Party, the uh, Islamic socialism, those type of principles. So he had to be, you know, pushed out. And so, I mean, she's the sitting prime minister. And he is, and, and the police in Sindh is completely told not to interfere, and he is assassinated. And her daughter, who is Benazir Bhutto's 
niece accuses directly accuses Benazir Bhutto and 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 uh, Asif Ali Zardari, the the corrupt husband of of doing that assassination. And so so if you want to talk about hybrid regimes, these two th- these governments were up to doing this, and it was during that Benazir government. You know this 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 great Taliban that's back now in power and in, in, uh, that is when the Taliban came to power I in see. 1996. Did Benazir Bhutto give a damn? No, they were having a great time in the country. That's so if, yeah. if you if you want to talk about hybrid regimes where a civilian government defers completely to whatever the military wants to do, it's been every single government since Imran Khan. Yeah. That is. So I want to clear this concept. I really want to clarify because the liberals and sections, sadly, of the left have 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 have, have picked up on this concept and and they 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 dare not define it because they can't define it. I mean, I mean, if they if you if you push them on it, you know, they, they don't know what to do. Well, so this is obviously like so, like an internal debate inside Pakistan. I can tell. Right, <laughs> about, right. Yeah, you're right, getting but, quite But, but, but Ronnie, yeah. you do know you you probably have seen the term like you know deployed yeah. a lot, a lot, and and that's Definitely. that's the only reason why I wanted to spend a little time on going this on, be, going be, on be, be, stuff. because I mean to accuse Imran as a puppet. Well, now they can't even do that. The poor liberals and the leftists can't even do that anymore because he's being targeted. By, by basically everybody. Right, So right. they can't even do that anymore, which they, you know, tried to do at the beginning of his term in power. Well, so then you have, uh, before before we get to some of the more internal stuff, then you have, I just want to, like, you mentioned the war, like he had gone to Moscow that day with the, when, yeah. when Russia had gone into Ukraine. Uh, and moreover, I mean, after that, he basically refused, like many countries in the global south, and like Pakistan actually continues to do, uh, refused to get on board with like the U.S. Um, uh, sanctions on Russia um, and just the whole U.S. narrative about what was happening. So that obviously angered the U.S. And then, you know, I think something that's also important to note about Imran Khan when we talk about his non-aligned foreign policy was that he signaled this desire to improve ties with India, but then also refused to condemn China over allegations of human rights abuses and really pr- refused basically to participate in escalating the Cold War against China uh, by the U.S. Mm, of course. Um, which was, which I imagine, I don't know actually if that was controversial inside Pakistan or not, but certainly upset the Americans. Um, so I just think that's all important to say when we talk about how the Americans might feel about Imran Khan as the leader of Pakistan. And then, of course, there are the pro-American elements inside of Pakistan. And you kind of talk a little bit about that when you talk about these ruling parties. Um, yeah. Which I think in some of the pieces that you've written, you call them dynastic political parties. Yeah. Uh, saying until Khan, you know, Pakistan was controlled by these corrupt dynastic political parties that work in tandem with the military to control Pakistan, the sort of hybrid regime. Yeah. That, yeah. That if, if, if nothing else has happened, the, the uh, Pakistani dynastic politics has ended, which is a great thing. Right. Point. Well, <laughs> right. So I, think, so I think it's important to note, though, that like, in respect to Khan being ousted, I mean, we, you've talked about like how other leaders of Pakistan have been assassinated um, or in some cases executed or in some cases like their planes have mysteriously crashed. Uh, no Pakistani leader ever seems to finish their term. But in, what's unique here is that in the aftermath of Khan's ouster, you have this outpouring of support with these massive mobilizations that have continued throughout the last year. Um uh, which has, you know, been, I mean, somewhat ignored in Western media for the most part. Um, and he's been portrayed also, I would say, in in Western media. To Except some for democracy as, now, of course. Except for democracy now. He's been portrayed as this, like, right-wing populist. And then some argue that it wasn't even a coup. I'm curious how you would um, respond to that sentiment that he's, like, this right-wing populist. And maybe from there, you mentioned it a little bit before, but could you tell me, like, who is Khan's base? Right. Okay, so so th- there's there's a lot there, and it's 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 like right on point. I mean, you've <laughs> you've like captured like all the kind of salient features of th- this whole kind of phenomena as it's been un- unfolding. Um, let me get to the for, b- b- because I'll I'll forget it every single time the, the foreign policy fund. Uh, uh, okay, very, go ahead. Very, yes. very, qu- very quickly. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, so the 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 hybrid regime uh, label that was put on Khan was basically saying that the, was basically 
because Khan, uh, like the military or unlike the military, who cares what the military says in public or in private, but Khan believed in an independent, sovereign Pakistan. But he still believed, like many uh, third world leaders, particularly the leaders of the of the global south uh, in the 60s and 70s, that uh, uh, that a decolonization was still incomplete. That we need to deepen decolonization, and so he he had known that Pakistan from its very inception had bought into the Western camp uh, through various treaties, the Baghdad Pact, Seattle, Sento, um, and it was in that camp versus, say, for example, India, which was in the non-aligned movement with uh, Indonesia, Sukarno, and Tito, and 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 Kamal of the Lasser. So he knew that that was the history, and because of that history, uh, uh, a horrible uh, effects had afflicted Pakistan, especially the 1980s Afghan jihad against the Soviets in in um, in Afghanistan. And so, uh, by this point, Khan said that, look, we need to establish our own independent foreign policy. He did not say that we need to go to war with America or we need to be enemies of America. He did not. He said that we will be friends with the United States in times of peace, uh, in times of peace, but we cannot be in times of war. That's all that he said. And so uh, his, his position was not that uh, we be pro this, we take this side or that position or this, but that we be pro peace, which was demonstrated clearly. I mean, if, 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 if this had to be proven by any, sp- any specific piece of evidence, it was the issue, as you said, about India. When he came to power, you, if, if you really want to talk about a right-wing nutcase coming to power, really chauvinist, etc., their first target will be India because people will know that India and Pakistan have been arch enemies, arch rivals since their very birth. He, he spent the first two years begging this uh, a, a fascist war criminal who's the prime minister of India, uh, uh, Modi, to come to the negotiating table uh, on issues of Kashmir, but not only Kashmir, other trade and so on and so forth. And what Modi did, and this is what uh, Imran emphasized in his very popular, very, very popular UN speech, which like, you know, was went berserk all over the world. Um, I mean, he, he said that what Modi did is he took like my approaching him uh, and and saying, look, you you guys take one step one step forward, we'll take two steps forward. You know, to, to, he what Modi did in his election campaign said, look, they, they're afraid of us now, and they're running to us, and and totally humiliated Khan on that. And so, and so that's what happened on the India front, and therefore that then collapsed. You know, that 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 went away. And after that, uh, sorry, actually before the UN speech that he gave, India also, if you remember, then clamped down on Kashmir, removed its status yeah. um, as its autonomous status. And it's it's a horrible situation right now uh, in Kashmir, as well as for Indian Muslims generally in, within India. So uh, so but so there was no ha- these all of these liberals and left uh, Khan as a fascist, as a right winger. Dude, the guy was trying for two years to, to beg the Indians who are the arch rivals that the military hates every to, to kind of let's negotiate. Okay, there you go. Number one. Number uh, number two, uh, which uh, uh, the, the issue of China. China has been Pakistan's uh, longest standing, reliable, consistent ally and friend uh, since the 1960s. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear the rest, you can access it by becoming a Breakthrough News member at patreon.com slash breakthrough news.